Hey. Hi. Good morning. How good are morning. You? I'm so thrilled to have you on the show. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm yeah. thrilled to be here. I know we have a lot to talk about, and you're a busy, very busy woman. So let's get to it. <laughs> uh, the first thing I want to do is introduce you. Four billion in sales. The top one percent of Hilton and Highland agents. You've been in this business for so long, Linda. You were the first woman to create her own real estate brand, Linda May Properties. Right. Tell me, what do you think is your number one advice for realtors getting their start in the industry now? Well, I think that you have to always differentiate yourself. You need to to find someone to be your mentor. You need to. Find a group of people that you want to work with. You need to find a culture that feels good to you because every office and every group of people have their own value system and, and so the way that they roll. So true. So I, I think, and the, and the big thing is know the inventory. The first thing a new broker should do is every, every chance they can to go out and look at property. They need to I know love that. that. I love that. And you, you talk a lot about visualization, which I, I thought was really true because we like to start at the end result and work backwards. So you say visualize selling the property and then work backwards from there. Right. I, I, I think strategically. I think about the end, where I'm going and where I want, want to wind up. So it, what happens is you play a lot of scenarios along the way. So nothing surprises you. And you also are ready to give advice and act. I love so that. So I think looking at the where you're going is the key. And you do a lot of, you said like find your tribe, find the broker yeah. that speaks to you. That is so key because some people, they hop around from brokerage to brokerage. You're at Hilton and Highland. What about Hilton and Highland speaks to you? Well, I think that they have the most, uh, highest, pre you know, highest presence Yes. in the luxury market they yes, do it they do. exquisitely elegantly there's a culture there of really fine fineness and i think the, just by the mere fact that we represent all the most famous houses the name houses you have the partners have a deep history in vintage houses and yes that's a great historian and i think that all of that uh, along with a lot of top agents working together, there's great synergy there. And that's what attracted me. Amazing. Well, let's actually get to some of your incredible listings. You're going to see me look down as I scroll through and pull up your first listing, which is actually $62 million in Holmby Hills, eight bedrooms, 14 baths. But the key here is two acres in Holmby Hills. Tell us about this property, Linda. Well, first of all, I'm announcing it on your show. Oh my God, this is a Real Talk exclusive? I this love that. This is a Real Talk exclusive, okay? <laughs> so I have this property listed, but we haven't put it yet in the MLS. Uh, I listed it right as we were going into the COVID situation. So keeping it kind of uh, as a, a very quiet listing, of course, a lot of the top brokers know about it, but. This is the first time I'm actually speaking about it. Get uh, giving me I'm honored. opportunity. I'm honored. Laura Carvendova says hi, Linda, and Tomer says it's superb. Juliet says hi, Linda. Let's hi everybody. Hi everybody. Let's look inside. It, it, yes. This is a beautiful home and meticulous for Homeby Hills, which is known for having homes that need a little TLC. That's right. Well, this house. It's a famous house. Nobody remembers this name, but Fanny Bryce, a million years lived there, who was- I, know, I remember Fanny Bryce. All right, so this was Fanny Bryce's house. Wow. But these present owners have incredible taste and hired Oscar Shamamian to do the renovation, which was, they built a brand new house in the style and era of the, uh, this original Paul Williams, which is one of his best. But it has, you're right, it has two flat acres, tennis court, the most gorgeous pool pavilion. Thank you for showing it. That's brand new. The pool pavilion and the pool are new. Wow. And it's, and it's gorgeous. Flawless. It has it's a reason. Flawless. It's, it's flawless. And the interiors as well. They kept everything in 
that era, the steel case windows. There's the master bedroom. Look at how divine that is. I mean, it's storybook living it in Holmby Hills book. for sure. And yeah. so when you're being a when you're not listing something on the MLS and you're not, you're announcing it on Real Talk, how do you get it out to those top agents? Do you take them through one by one? Do you do an email list? How do you start that whisper campaign for a house? Well, I think that there's probably 25 or 30 brokers that, you know, all the top tier mm -hmm. want, want to know about their listing because they have buyers. They have buyers now or in the past they've had buyers. I agree. So I think that, you know, the whisper campaign is always a great way to let people know you have something special because there is that cachet of having your client be the first person or, you know, one of the first people to see a house. Yes. That, that's yes. a great thing to say to a buyer. You're the first person to see this house. <laughs> I am dying that we got the exclusive. I love it so much. Let's you have the exclusive. <laughs> Thank you. And I, I, I think it is one more picture from this home. Look at this beautiful, like just the, the woodwork and it yeah. looks like you're in a storybook. I, I love this house. It, so, it is, it's stunning. And 62 million acres in Holmby Hills, is that normal? I think that's the, the right range of value. The house is 15,000 square feet and 17 or 18,000 square feet, including the guest house. So I think that for something this special, where you have two acres, you actually have three guest houses on the property. And it's turnkey. Some of it's these homes turnkey. you see, you're like, uh, It's turnkey. You just uh -huh. walk in. The dining room is one of the most exquisite dining rooms in the city. And they have a screening room that is just stunning beyond measure. Beautiful. Well. Reach out to Linda May if you are one of those agents that have a buyer for this two acres in Holmby Hills. Properties in Holmby Hills don't come up that often, so it, it's definitely worth a phone call. Linda, take us to uh, Perugia Way, 35 million. I love this listing because it is a rebrand. And I think in this moment, in this time, uh, rebranding is so important. So. I want to know what you and your co-listing agent did to rebrand this modern property. Well, I have this listed with Jade Mills. And what we did was it had been on for quite a while before we listed it. And we, we went in and we were very honest with the sellers. We said, we need to restage this house. Yeah, which to... a lot of people say when they go to a house. But you said, we need to change the look of this house. That's right. Completely. That's right. We needed to appeal, you and I have spoken a bit about it. We needed to ap appeal to the new buyer that's coming into our, our in, into Los Angeles and into Bel Air and Homby Hills that is domestic, who wants a more refined uh, kind of organic look to... Because the foreign buyer is gone. And he's gone. Are, 2017, these homes were built. And I always say that real estate's like fashion, like it's going to come in and it's going to go out. So you have to be able to change with the times. And so let's go inside. You gave it a different look. We, we took it down a notch. We took out all the glitz. We took out all the kind of glittery. It wasn't gl that it was glittery, but it didn't relate really to the outdoors. Because the house, the, when it's all opened up, it's one exquisite space. We wanted it to feel that you could move from, you know, indoors to outdoors effortlessly and you weren't really identifying that movement. Mm -hmm. so, and we also changed all the artwork in the house. And Interesting. And did you use uh, creative art partners or did you use somebody else for the artwork? Uh, the owners had a personal relationship with an art dealer. And I think that they were able to really uh, identify paintings that they themselves thought worked better. So like this over, one. Like that one. Yeah. Nice. So, so you give it this warm, like this breathy, organic, modern feel as opposed to a glossy modern. Right. And it related then to the stone in the house. They had chosen beautiful stone and mm -hmm. and it has beautiful uh, views and things like that. And it it brought out all the rooms and brought out the scale. But when yeah. you when you come and you tell the owner, we need to change the entire look of this house, not just staging, we're going to do the art and everything. Who pays for that? Is that you paying the for seller. that? Or? 
know the seller. You you have to have people believe in what you're saying. That's it. There you go. I, I mean, you have to have their confidence. It's just not about signing you up. They have mm -hmm. to really go forward with your vision for how the house should show and look and who we're going to show it to. Yes. And I think that is why you get the listing is because they trust your vision. So to go in with that vision and double down on it is very, very true. Tomer says it's much more refined. Great choice. Uh, the fine Italian window says it's the modern, most utmost refinement. So everyone's agreeing with your look. I'm curious to see what it looked like before. We'll send you old photographs. <laughs> oh, I, would, I would love, I would love to see this. And then Megan's in my sliding into my comment section and correcting us on the price. Thank you, Megan. Um, well, Linda, that those are both gorgeous properties. Now I'm going to test you. Let's go play a game where the people at home can win everyday essence. Oh, fantastic. Organic skincare line. Don't worry, Linda, some's coming to you in the mail. And we're going to play Name That Architect. So I'm going to try and stump you, Linda, because I know you're good at this. Uh-oh. <laughs> you're good at this. So here's the first one. Let's see here. It's a case study house number 20. I'm going to blow it up for you. Ooh. Oh, it's it's a two bedroom meant to serve parents who find they can afford just that. And it was a it's in Pasadena, natural wood house. This is too hard for you. It's a kind of a small I think picture. It is, but I mean, is it a Neutra? Who did K a lot of? Oh my God! It is a Neutra. Oh, okay. Because I'm thinking, who did case study houses and name them that way? That's that was. I was, th I, I didn't know, but I, I that's insane. You're so good. The picture's like this big. It's crazy. <laughs> okay, I'm going to show you another one. And, audience, you guys can guess along. Here's another one. Don't worry, I'll blow up the picture. It's, okay. a, it's a base house. It's called the Base House. Hmm. It's designed in 1958 for our fa famed graphic designer, Saul Base. It's unique. It's a central part. I'm going to blow it up for you. Here we go. Is it in Brentwood? Um, I don't know no, if it's no. in Brentwood, but you've got those core plywood vaults right there that are kind of a dead giveaway. It's a very famous architect. Um, if you get it, I'll be shocked. We've got a okay. Richard Neutra guest down in the comment section. Is it, is it a Neutra? No. No, it's not a no, Neutra. No, We've not. got a Pierre Conan guess down in the comment section those are both incorrect <laughs> okay and it's Another, not frank gary no it's not frank okay. gary well well uh is there, it's a douglas fir plywood products that might give it away too uh, amir in the comment section gets it right it's a buff oh. and hensman oh buff and hensman yes good wow. job amir jeez right, amir well, wins good. every day he's crazy Okay, last one. That's and then an we're... exciting one. I, I have not seen that one. That, that looks very exciting. Here's an easy one for you. Okay. <laughs> this is a house currently on the market. It's in Hillcrest. In, uh, uh, sorry, it's up on Billionaire's Row. It's got a lot of publicity. Is it a Paul McLean? It is a Paul McLean. Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, you get <laughs> Amir again for the win. Thank you, Amir. And last one coming at you now. Okay. This is built in 1953, the Squire House. Came mm. to market for the first time in 22 years. I have more pictures of this one, so it won't be so hard. Um, you really see uh, his work inside. It's very chic very chic like I don't even know where this is but I would move here it's 9,800 square feet Alta Kendada neighborhood and it was listed for mm. 1.4 oh Amir got it wrong finally it's not a Koenig I'm I'm not sure what it is either actually uh, it's Amir a is right it is a Pierre Koenig is it Pierre Koenig Amir <laughs> what is going on? We have to have you on the show. Linda, you did a great job. Don't worry, you're getting your everyday essence. In Just a perfect. perfect. We're sending, we're, we're, don't worry, we're going to send you organic skincare no matter what. Okay. And let's, let's go back to your listings because I want to get to this one. This is also done by a famous architect. Yes. 32.5 million on Stradella Road in Bel Air, 11,000 square feet.
Bill Michael Bay's house, Brian Grazer, Clive Davis, wow. Darren Starr, and the likes. And he also does incredible, uh, he, he just finished the plaza at the Music Center and the 10-year renovation of the Hollywood Bowl. Wow. So look at, look oh, my God. This, look at this stunning, just so simple uh, Perfection. piece of architecture at the end of the pool. It mm -hmm. says everything about the property and the elegance of it. He's a minimalist, which, of course, when he does projects for clients, he, he does what they want. But I think this house shows off that. Yes, you can see from the interior That's the cool. minimalism. And we've gone from maximalism in 2017 <laughs> to minimalism in 2020. There you go. But this has, you know, it's a stunning house with beautiful views. Everything's open to the LA basin and the ocean. And it has a beautiful master and library. There's a great picture of the library, I think. Uh, here we go, library. I'm gonna make it small so you can see. It's like a staircase leading up to a lot. A lounge. Yeah, a beautiful lounge, and then these picturesque sunsets that you get. Yeah, it's really that. Just phenomenal. It's beautiful how it's peekaboo. Everything <laughs> was thought out, too, so that you could make the property just, you know, everywhere you looked, you're seeing the view. Exactly. Nothing, Pe nothing stopping your eye. The comment section is loving it. Geometric Bliss, Mark Rios is a genius, <laughs> and it's divine, says Renaissance Realtor. I, I love this property too. Which of these three properties would you buy, Linda? You have unlimited money. It's well, I think I would, I would buy them all. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I would live in each one for a short period of time. <laughs> good, good, good answer. Good answer. Well, Linda, you and I spoke about, um, I want to share a little history lesson with the audience. And you love history. You love historic homes. So I thought together we would tell them the history of this property and who it belonged to. Right. And you guys at home, this story like struck such a chord with us. It is about Nat King Cole and how he integrated Honey, uh, sorry, Hancock Park. So like Nat King Cole bought this house in 1948 and uh, sorry, 58. And what he did was he was the first black resident in Hancock Park and he knew that he couldn't, his realtor knew he couldn't put an offer in. So they hired a light skinned realtor to put an offer in of $6,000. And when the board, uh, the seller accepted it, then she transferred the deed over to at Nat King Cole, which I love. Have you, and, and he- It's an incredible. In, <laughs> it's an incredible story. It's he incredible. moved in with his family but there was covenants for this property. Linda, did you know about, you know about covenants in Los Angeles and how it changed, really well, shaped neighborhoods. There were covenants in Bel Air and they didn't allow blacks or Jews or lots of people. They were clear cut. They, and I didn't know specifically about Hancock Park, but you know, of course these things did exist in the old covenants. So it is very interesting. This is an amazing story. And this story also, Hancock Park, it didn't allow Jews as well, or Hasidic Jews, any other person who was not white. And it actually says any person whose blood is not entirely that of a Caucasian race. So he moves in with his family and the neighbors get together and they form the Hancock Park Association to find a solution to the problem, to get him out. And one of the neighbors goes up to him finally and says, you know, we have nothing against you. We think you're very talented, but uh, at the same time, we don't want any undesirables living in this neighborhood. And he famously said to them, well, if I see any, I'll let you know. I think that is amazing. I love that. I love that. <laughs> so, I love that. I would have so, said, well, you better move out. <laughs> yeah, so I'm sorry. So he bought it in 1948 through the 50s. They were dealing with a lot of uh, racism from their neighbors, everything from burning crosses on their lawns, to poisoning their dog, to uh, trying to get them out of this house. And uh, they also had great moments. You know, Natalie King Cole, Natalie Cole, who grew up in this house, said she was young and she didn't really, you know, experience a lot of the racism. She grew up with the kids from the Ralphs family and the Vaughns family, and they'd ride their bikes together. So they were a little, like, not so aware of it. But her mother really was. And Nat, uh, Nat King Cole would travel and go, uh, you know, be touring. So they were really at home alone. And uh, he was traveling so much, he forgot to pay the taxes. 
And uh -oh. <laughs> yeah, the IRS actually came and tried to seize the house for $147,000 of back taxes. And if you look in this picture, which I love, you can see the cameras to the left, but they tried to cut it out of the photo. And it said that the neighbors kind of tipped them off and Nat King Cole got together with the paper and he said, selling my house is not gonna solve this problem. All I need is a little time and I can straighten this out. And through the Los Angeles Centennial, putting some pressure on the IRS, they gave him an extended timeline and he was able to pay it off and they lived there for a while. And through the 60s, you know, the, the neighbors kind of saw the light and he became a loved part of the neighborhood. There is a happy ending to this story. In the, uh, he died late 60s, in the early 70s, his wife sold the house to a family friend so that it would always be owned by African-American families. And to this day, that house on Mirafield and 4th Street is still owned by African-American families. Linda, why don't you take it and tell us what the happy, happy ending is to this final piece of the story? Well, I think that, you know, what ha happened from those, oh yes, this is, you shared this with me earlier. This is the only post office I guess in California or, or in Los Angeles, in yeah. Los Angeles, named after one of the greatest, you know, singers and totally. icons of the music world in our in our time. And it's usually politicians or mayors or the city council or whatever. And I think that that is a tremendous tribute to Nat King Cole and also for what he did for holding his ground. There's more behind that than just being a great singer. He held his ground and came to make, you know, open a neighborhood that, you know, everyone respected him for doing something like that. And, uh, and to this day, African-American families still own that house and Chandra Rhimes owns four homes there. A lot of Hasidic Jews have moved into the neighborhood because it's walkable from their mosque and Jewish families. So he integrated that neighborhood, not just for his family, but for everybody. Yes. He's one of my favorite jazz singers. And I just, I love that story. Um, it makes me uh, cry a little bit. So if, when you guys are in LA, drive by Mirafeld, South Mirafeld and Fourth, and you can actually see the house, um, which all right, here are some people doing that. <laughs> <laughs> That's so great. That's I love great that story. story. It's I a love great that story, story so much. Linda, thank you so much for coming on the show. You are you are literally a, a female icon to us, and you've paved the way for a lot of females in the real estate industry. What would you say is your number one advice as a piece of your last piece of advice before we sign off? What is your number one advice for agents getting started? What what should we do? Should we should we visualize? Should we get involved in charity? What should we do? You know, you, I can't, I would say that you have to really work hard, but I think what you also have to do is build relationships. This is your foundation for your entire career, building relationships with other brokers and having them know that you're a straight shooter and that everything when you say something, it's meaningful and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, work hard because there's, that's the only way you can be successful in real estate and build your relationships. And, and, you're, and have integrity. The most important thing is be honest and have integrity. If you have to take heat on something, what we say in our office is eat the frog, take the heat. <laughs> Wait, what does that mean? Eat the frog. That means do the, get it over with. Eat the frog yeah. and go deal with it. Yeah, yeah. And you're actually, you serve, I, I get that. Because we also say in PR, like, bad news doesn't get better with time. You've got to right. <laughs> deliver that bad news right away. It doesn't get right. better with time. Um, <laughs> right. But also, uh, the longer you wait, the worse it gets. You, you, I noticed you serve on a lot of boards, though, too. Like, you're involved in the MOCA and the Wallace and, and the LA Opera and, you're, you volunteer a lot of your time. Do you think that helps your career or you do that as selfless service? I think it's selfless service that you, what you do is you find the things that are very meaningful to you and work on them and, and bring yourself and others to, to help you in, achieve goals in these various organizations. And I think what it does is 
that you meet like people, people that think like you think. And from that, you start building relationships. You can't be insincere when you're working on at-risk youth, like a place called home or Aviva Children and Family Services. They're not glamorous. You're not getting dressed up in a ball gown right. to go to a party. It's real. It's real. And so if you can find the things that touch your heart, you're going to find things that make a difference in your life. And be a giver and not a taker. Be a giver. Well, Linda, thank you so much for keeping it real with us here on Real Talk. <laughs> I really appreciate all your time. Loved it. And energy. Loved it. Loved it. And you're, I, I love watching everything. So. Thanks for watching. Enjoy it. I'll talk to you soon. Talk soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh, Linda's wonderful. And that story's wonderful. And those listings are incredible. And would you give us a Real Talk exclusive, which I'm dying for? Don't go away, you guys. We have Sharona coming up. Sharona Alpern, who is with Sotheby's. She's going to show us some more listings and tell us about her real estate career and how she juggled it all. Kids, uh, family life, and... Uh, a career 